Welcome to Arts in Conversations. Our guests for this show are J.J. Patishal and Dwayne White from the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association. This program is brought to you by Creative Pinellas. Our mission is to facilitate a vibrant, integrative, collaborative, and sustainable Pinellas County arts community and arts and cultural destination. Creative Pinellas is funded in part by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners, Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and the State of Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. Joining us in this week's conversation are J.J. Patishal and Dwayne White of the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association. Hello, good evening. I'm Barbara St. Clair, CEO of Creative Pinellas, and I'm surrounded right now by Danny Alda and uh, Lee Davis from Creative Pinellas. Danny is our manager of cultural programs curatorial programs and engagement, and Lee is our cultural outreach manager, and they are going to be your hosts today for a wonderful conversation with J.J. Patishaw and Dwayne White. We are so happy you're here, and this is going to be a wonderful experience, so thank you for coming, and please enjoy. Thank you, Barbara. Hey, thank Danny. You, Barbara. Hey, Lee. <laughs> I'm excited to have uh, Dwayne and uh, J.J. here with us. So before we get started, um, it probably would be uh, best to begin with uh, to get to know more about Dwayne and JJ. We have uh, a couple of bios of them. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and check that out before we get right into the question. Cool. I will get on that. J.J. Patishal is the next generation in a lineage of talented musicians, educators, and community leaders firmly rooted in cultural tradition and creative innovation. Born into a musical family, J.J.'s love for music was cultivated from an early age. Today, as a sought-after guitarist, vocalist, and instructor steeped in jazz and roots tradition, J.J. is quickly making a name for himself as both a solo artist and a accompanist. His global outlook combined with a down-home sensibility give him the unique ability to connect with audiences from all walks of life. Dwayne White is a professional trumpeter and music educator who moved to Tampa in 1996. He served as music specialist at Lanier Elementary School, where his colleagues selected him as Teacher of the Year in 2004. Dwayne currently works as a counselor at Tampa YMCA Youth Development. In his role as the Chairman of Education and Scholarship Committee, Dwayne is largely responsible for the Al Downing Jazz for Youth Initiative, which presents clinics and performances at several school and community settings in the Tampa Bay area. He throughout Florida. Welcome, welcome. Jay and Dwayne. I'm on. You may have uh, frozen for a bit here. Oh, so, okay. Um, I'm frozen now. All right. So we're excited to have you, uh, JJ and Dwayne. Um, we could speak with a couple of great musicians uh, working uh, here locally, but uh, also, of course, like I mentioned in the bios, uh, you guys work with Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association. And so, um, of course, that might be a great place to begin the conversation tonight. Uh, I wanted to ask, first of all, um, who Al Downing was and, and how does the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association uh, continue his legacy? Well, I, I, I'll take that. Uh, Al Downing was an educator. He was a musician first, and he was an educator as well. He played uh, piano and organ and keyboard instruments. 
and uh, he taught uh, for for a lot of time in his career. He uh, he actually was uh, in the army at one point. He was a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, he, he had a varied background, but how I came to know Al Downing when I moved to, t to the Tampa Bay area. He actually gave me my first gig as a professional musician in the Tampa Bay area. And uh, once I found out a little more about him, I found out about his education background. That was one of the things that influenced me. And uh, I, he taught at on, on several different levels, elementary level, high school level. He taught at Gibbs High School, taught at Perkins Elementary School taught at St. Pete Junior College it was, was it, at the time. And uh, he, he was a fantastic educator and he was a wonderful jazz mentor to a lot of people in the area here. And um, one of the things uh, when I was asked to be a part of the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association, I thought of Al Downing himself and the mission that he had. And one of the uh, requests that was uh, requested of me was to take over the education and scholarship role. And again, just knowing who Al Downing himself was, and then the influence that he had on me, taking me somebody new to the area and welcoming me into the jazz community and uh, acting as a mentor to me and some of my friends as well. It was a perfect fit for me. Sounds like an amazing man. And he passed away in, in 2000, is that correct? Yes, he passed away in 2000. Well, you're doing a wonderful job continuing his legacy. Tell us a little bit about your members and how the organization supports their career as musicians. And I'd like you to take this a little bit both pre-COVID and now. Well, sure. Um, you know, first I'll say thanks for having us here again. This is really awesome. Um, you know, to, I'll start that by uh, kind of uh, piggybacking off of what some of what Dwayne just said, in that um, Dwayne has been super instrumental in me actually getting to know. You know, I moved to, to relocated to Orlando. Uh, excuse me, to St. Pete from Orlando uh, several years ago, um, and so. I was making my way through and uh, Al Downing was really one of the first, my, uh, it's just a great point of contact within, within the community. It's an established, uh, an established organization. And um, it was, as I got to know, got to know our members, I really started to, even though uh, Al Downing passed away before my time and even some of the members, uh, some of the musicians who have been a part of our organization um, over the years who I've heard through stories, um, uh, are, are, have, have since passed away as well. Um, it's not uh, it, it's not difficult after a few conversations to find out to, to kind of learn about that legacy. Um, musicians like Dwayne um, and on any Monday night, if you've been to one of our jazz jams, what we'll talk about later, um, you know, the kind of his his influence and his reach. Um, I have been fortunate to uh, experience some of that just in the conversations that I've had uh, with our members. Uh, when we talk about our members, it's, uh, I was thinking about this and it's really kind of an interesting dynamic in that the members are a mix of musicians, uh, which are definitely kind of the, uh, the heartbeat and the soul of the organization, to community members. We've got our uh, people who have been with the organization for maybe since it's, uh, if not its inception, since pretty pretty close till, who have been, uh, some have since moved away, um, but we have a, a pretty tight-knit community. Uh, we also have community partners like, uh, we have folks like The Hangar, uh, where we do our Monday Night Jazz Jam, uh, the, the Carter Woodson Museum, uh, directed by Terry Lipsy Scott. We're fortunate to have some of these community partnerships. Um, that's before we even get to the venues and even expanding out. So. It's really, uh, and I'm sure Dwayne will be able to have a little bit to say about this too, the interesting thing about jazz is that it's very much, jazz allows for a very uh, multicultural, multi-generational um, dynamic in a, certain way, in a certain way. And that's one of the things that I always, um, I think that's one of the things that drew me to this organization initially was just the fact that 
Um, you know, actually, if Dwayne's probably the first face you're going to see on a Monday night. So if you go to the Jazz Jam at the Hangar. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> what a you know? welcoming and, face and it is. Yeah, it's true. He's probably the first face, you know, he's the, he's the uh, that you're going to see. And um, so he, he was really instrumental in to really bringing me into the I'm pretty sure he's the one that brought me into the fold initially. Um, so all that to say, um, you you can't help but you notice just on any given night you've got young lions and that's what we that's what we affectionately call our our college and high school students and our, our veteran musicians who are really to me um based off of my own upbringing and my, the the dynamic that i kind of grew up around that really resonated with me that you could have this young generation playing alongside uh guys my age playing alongside guys my grandfather's age and that dynamic is really special and i think it's uh, it's it's unique to jazz. I don't. It's not necessarily the only spot where you'll find that, but it's definitely something that is uh, a unique quality about this music. So, um, uh, Dwayne, I don't know if there's anything else you'd have about that, but that gives you some idea. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that, JJ, because uh, it, it is multi generational, multicultural. It's not not unusual to to come on any night and have a 15 year old on stage with a 75 year old. You know that happens all the time. And they're both they learning from each other. You know, so there's right. So so yeah. I've been to some of the jams at the hangar. It's a beautiful thing to witness. Um, men, women, young, old, black, white, Latino, Asian, everyone, everyone. It's it's really fantastic. Such, and such is Jess. Oh, yeah. yeah. Talking about that sort of intergenerational uh, interchange, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, music, of a, of a jazz nerd, so I'm, I'm excited to be able to ask you guys who have been your uh, biggest influences um, musically. What, what is your musical background? Go for it, Dwayne. You start that. My, my musical background, I, I grew up in New Orleans, and... Uh, New Orleans is mu music is just another part of the culture there. It's it's what you uh, it, it's in the air. You you uh, you see and hear it everywhere you go, even if you even if you don't realize it. And uh, I grew up I grew up playing uh, trumpet, and I think I started playing when I was nine wow. in uh, grade school, and I played all the way through uh, my school career. I was in marching band, which is a big deal in uh, New Orleans as well. And uh, went to college, continued on with that at Florida A&M. Go Rattlers. I know there's some Rattlers listening on here. Um, I, uh, I really got serious about playing the trumpet when I was in college. Um, you know, I, I loved doing it in, uh, in high school. It was something I, I loved being in marching band. And, and I sort of got bit by the bug, but I didn't really take it really seriously until I got into college. And I really started getting serious about playing jazz, which funny enough is being from New Orleans, of, of course, like I said, it was in the background, but it's not something that I really pursued while I was living in New Orleans. It wasn't until I left that I really got serious about becoming a jazz musician. And uh, you asked about influences one of the major influences on me, uh, we were sort of talking about this before we came on, uh, Wynton Marcellus, uh, both as a trumpet player and as an educator as well. He's a huge influence on me personally. And uh, there's some other musical influences on me as well, like Clifford Brown, Louis Armstrong. Uh, but I, I think the my major entry point uh, was Wynton Marsalis because I was um, in the coming up in the early 80s, right when he started his career um, as a musician, and uh, he was a, a public figure. So he was one of the first people I saw. And uh, I, I sort of grew along as Wynton grew along. He's been so, so instrumental as a historian. You know, as a jazz so educator and jazz historian as well, and and really um, has moved through the culture 
in so many ways, you know, movie screen, movie um, soundtracks and just so many different ways that he's uh, kept it alive. Yeah, I would definitely. Say too, off of that, I mean, Dwayne, you'd probably be able to, you know, I think Winton is pretty, has also been very instrumental in helping to raise the profile of jazz and to really draw, you know, uh, in a certain way, uh, demand the, the respect that it deserves. Uh, you know, I mean, right alongside it is, right alongside um, highbrow classical music. You know, I mean, Winton has, but he, the, the, the unique thing about Winton, Dwayne and I talk about this a lot too, is that um, he has a unique ability to take the information and distill it in a way that is also um, accessible. So to somebody who is new to jazz, um, and I know we'll talk about this later, but if you're looking for a place to start, I mean, there's no better place to start than Winton. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, he, he definitely uh, takes it, takes uh, the everything in jazz and he makes it very accessible to the layman. You, you, you come in, you don't have to know anything about it, but he will explain it in a way that you understand exactly what he's talking about let's and give i think that's done a lot for the profile <laughs> yeah, so let's give some props to that whole the whole family you know the oh patriarch ellis marcellus just passed away this year and i know that he it gave so much to the new orleans community and was such a big influence yeah I actually, ellis I... marcellus oh go ahead JJ. No, no no go ahead go ahead go ahead uh ellis marcellus came to my when i was in junior high school he brought some students uh, from, of his from uh, NOCA, the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts, and they did a jazz presentation for us. I think I was in seventh grade or something. And that experience has stuck with me, and it's one of the things that kind of drives me in what I do uh, you know, with the Aldon and with education and outreach as well. So uh, Ellis Marcellus was a huge figure in the in the New Orleans music scene. Kind of on that, actually talking about that too. Just um, Ellis in a, in a, I kind of came uh, learned about Ellis coming in through the back door in a certain way, because I was as a child one of my probably earliest introductions to something. I mean, we grew up with a lot of jazz in the household. My my grandfather was a. Uh, played a lot of traditional New Orleans style jazz growing up and growing up in a family of musicians. But as far as real, like, uh, beyond kind of like Louis Armstrong, uh, I was drawn to, I think one day, it's one of my parents brought home a Harry Connick Jr. album. And all of a sudden that just, it was funny because as a kid, it was, you know, it was a little compared to what other, other uh, kids my age were listening to. It was, uh, it was a little odd and it wasn't kind of the typical listening for somebody that age this is like 12, 13. Um, but in that, it's funny because now I look back on that and I look at that, at somebody like, I'll just say Harry Connick Jr. At that time, he actually kind of opened the door and like, once I found out, oh, Ellis Marsalis was his piano teacher. And that led me to Brantford and Winton and all of New Orleans and beyond. So um, that that family is a, is just always been like a super, uh, very much an inspiration to myself as well. So, well, let's very hear cool. Some. Let's hear some. What you think? Yeah, Dan? all right. Can we get them to so play some music? Our, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our first uh, music break. I understand, uh, JJ, you you've got something prepared for us. Yeah, you know. So I, well, I guess uh, I guess the theme uh, for the first part of it, uh, Dwayne and I, I know we were kind of riding the same wavelength here. So it'll be a little bit of a uh, a New Orleans vibe. Um, I'm going to start with something. We'll kind of go both sides of the spectrum here. I'm going to play a tune, um, a little bit of a tune called St. James Infirmary. And uh, uh, it's kind of an, an old blues tune um, that is performed pretty regularly by quite a number of uh, New Orleans artists. And everybody from Louis Armstrong to Cab Calloway, uh, Alan Toussaint to John Baptiste and Trombone Shorty, everybody's kind of done their take on this tune. So I'm just going to do a little something that's my nod to them. And also the, the, the lyrics are oddly uh, um, relevant in the time that we're in. So.
I went down to St. James Infirmary I saw my baby lying there She was stretched out on a long white table So cold, so white, so fair Let her go God bless her soul Where she's gone I just don't know You can search This world wide over But you'll never find Another sharp dressed man Quite like me Where she's gone, I just don't know You can search this world wide over But you'll never find another man quite like me No, you'll never find another man quite like me Never found another man quite like me. St. James Infirmary. Very nice. Right. Thank you. Where's my clap? Okay. A clap icon. <laughs> yeah, a clap icon. Come on. Oh wait, wait. Yeah, I can. I, can do that. Right. I like that better, actually. You know, it's like something to like let people know. You know. Hey, Dwayne. Do you think that we could go a little bit off book and get you to uh, play now? Uh, we might be able to do something like that. <laughs> that I mean, see, improvisation, people. Improvisation. <laughs> um, this, this, uh, this week, uh, the past few days, it's been a couple of uh, dates uh, involving Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong was born on July fourth, uh, nineteen hundred. He celebrated that his whole life and. Later on, there was some documentation, this is kind of controversial, that stated that his birthday was actually August 4th, 1901. So from July 4th to August 4th, at, at the uh, Monday Night Jazz Jam, we kind of did, did, uh, did this as a tradition. We celebrate that whole month as the month of Louis Armstrong. So I'm going to play a little uh, Louis Armstrong for you. This was this. Uh, song that he used as his theme song for most of his career, uh, When It's Sleepy Time Down South. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
sleepy time down south. Nod to the great Louis Armstrong. <laughs> Fantastic. Very I, nice. It's so nice, right? I hear so much sorrow and I hear so many levels in jazz. Why do you think jazz is such a heart pull for some people and some people just, they can't get down with it? Why is it so polarizing? You have any thoughts about why? I, I, I do have a thought. I, I think one of the reasons, well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is the intense, intensely individual nature of the music, of the people performing the music. Um, what, what I do may not speak to everybody because what I have to say and how I approach it, again, it's me as the individual. That may not resonate with everybody. So some people, again, will be drawn right to it. Some people put some people away. The other thing is um, listening, listening to jazz uh, is, is a, a, a little bit of a different, uh, different animal because you have to bring a little bit to the process. So much music nowadays is, you know, it's, it's played all over. It's become so much in the background of everything we do you don't really have to do anything because it's there. You know, you, you, you wash your dishes and music can be playing and you'll hear it. But in order to listen to jazz, it's a little bit more, you have to bring something to the process. It's a music that serves the listener better than uh, it does just somebody hearing the music in the background. So I, that, that's, my personal opinion, I think that's a couple of the reasons why is there is such a difference there. There is a, on that, I mean, I think um, everything that Dwayne said is right on. I mean, same thing. I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's definitely, I, especially even from the listening aspect. And that's, uh, that's something that has been, listening has become an art in itself in, in these days in the age of distraction. Um, but, um, I guess something I might add to it too, is like, um, especially in this time is that jazz, uh, to me anyways, um, there's so many different expressions of it, um, and in so many ways, and this kind of, I will touch on something else. I think when you talk about even like getting into jazz, um, finding, you know, you can, it's finding some people that when they say, uh, they just, they're just not feeling it. Well, sometimes I think, well, maybe you just haven't found the artist that connects with you because I think, I think that there's somebody, uh, there may be some that you prefer over others. Uh, you might be, a, maybe you can't get into th everything Thelonious Monk does, but you like what, uh, my, some of what Miles Davis does. Maybe you like some of what Miles Davis does in the earlier part of his career, but you're not crazy about the, the later part of his career. And I think that's, um, kind of the beauty of, jazz is that it um there are there are so many different um ideas or i guess approaches to the music too and i concepts of what is jazz and what isn't i guess uh to, i see it in like the in the current the upcoming generation it's really interesting to see in the ways in which um they're really like it's impressive to see how the upcoming generation is really rooted in really up on some of these important players but they're also really open because of the influences that they are around today so everything whether it's hip-hop electronic music rock whatever they're listening to today uh trap music uh they're really open so i think really it's like hey find that point of entry maybe don't write it off you just got to find that artist that resonates with you you know if you like uh it doesn't matter who it is so yeah so sort of uh, towards that, for somebody that is just getting into jazz or maybe that wants to but has no idea where to start, uh, what, is a, what do you think is a good album to start with? Or what is sort of your go-to album to get people started? Mm. Go, uh, see, I got to think on that for a second. We'll, we'll each give you one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for me, uh, the go-to album would be Kind of Blue. 
and, and that's probably a, a lot of people's go-to album because uh, it's the, the the biggest selling jazz recording yeah. in history. So uh, that that would be my uh, that would be my go-to pick for somebody because I think it has uh, several different flavors in the record itself. So. I think somebody is looking to get into it. You will find something that you can get into on that. I gotta tell you, that was my first one. Uh, somebody got it as a gift for me when I was a teenager. Uh, yeah, so nice. really appropriate. I think that's. Hey, you just people. validated what I said. <laughs> I think that's probably a lot of people's first. Interestingly, I think it's probably a lot of people's first real like jazz album. I, I feel like I know that I got it as a gift from an uncle. So. I, I didn't know if it's funny because when he said that, I was like, kind of blue feels like a good starting point, but is that over? No, I don't want to use the word overplayed, but you feel like is it, mm -hmm. is it overstated to keep saying it? But it, it really is. I mean, it's just a great album. What about contemporary artists that you may uh, encourage people to get into? Oh man, that's just like a whole, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I, uh, that, I mean, any, for me, it's anything by Esperanza Spalding. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know something. She's uh, everything from, um, you know, the, her earlier stuff when she was coming out to even her. I was just listening today to 12 Little Spells, which is kind of out there, but it's uh, it when you put on, you got to listen to it with headphones. And it's yes. really I, I just really interesting. So for those of you who don't know, Esperanza Spaulding is a bass player and a singer. She's fantastic. Oh, wow. She's yes, she yeah. is. Okay. What about you, Dwayne? Anyone contemporary that you're really inspired by? I, I think the person that I'm inspired by is, is somebody, he's contemporary, but he comes out of the traditional side. He started as a traditional artist, and that's Nicholas Pate. Mm. Of course, he's another trumpet player as well. Uh, what, what he does today is not where he started his journey. Um, so, uh, I, I love that. the things that he does. Say more about that, Dwayne. So people, people who don't, may not know Nicholas Payton's journey, they can understand a little bit more what you mean about that. Nicholas Payton started his career. He was, he, he's born and raised in New Orleans as well. Uh, the city of trumpet players. Um, he was a protege at one point of Wynton Marsalis, uh, you know, talking about Wynton's influence. And he learned a lot of the traditional New Orleans music. His father, Nicholas's father was a musician as well. He was a bass player. So he came up through that traditional New Orleans route, playing tr traditional New Orleans jazz into, uh, into bebop and all of those things. But the things that he's doing now, he's incorporating a lot of uh, hip hop, e electronic music. He's no longer just a trumpet player. He's a uh, he's multi instrumentalist now. He plays on uh, on one one set. He'll play trumpet. He'll play Fender Rhodes piano, and um, he'll he'll also play bass. You know, like I said, his father was a bass player, so he uh, he takes all of those things and combines those things into some really interesting colors and moods and feels, I think. So somebody I, I think of as contemporary, contemporary with what he's doing now, but taking those traditional elements and moving them forward into the space that he's in now. He's on my list too. Yeah, actually, that, he was right there as well. That's actually, and if you ever want to chat, if you, for uh, any of you out there that, uh, very interesting figure too so if you follow him on instagram he'll uh he'll make you think too he's very outspoken <laughs> so uh he's he's uh really interesting intellectual he's just very much you know historian and intellectual as well so worth checking him out a l little plug for nicholas i guess too uh <laughs> the blue note uh the blue note club in new york they're doing these uh live from home sessions and he does one or two of them a week, Nicholas Payton does. And uh, it, it'd be well worth checking out, I think. It will, we'll check that out. Yeah. 
how do you gonna bring it go ahead Danny. i'm sorry i and i think i've taken a question that you had intended to ask too uh lee so sort of taking this uh a bit locally um so if you could tell us a bit about the history of, of jazz here in Pinellas County, where we live, and uh, you know some of the musicians, uh, venues, and communities that, that sort of build up that tapestry. Sure. Well, actually, I, I'm going to set it up because I think, again, Dwayne is from this area. Um, it's, it's been, well, he spent a lot more time in this. Actually, he spent a lot of time in this area. But I'll say I, I can say something that would kind of be a nice setup that I think he could kind of explain. Um, the one thing I noticed about it is uh, coming here from, um, you know, I grew up in Central Florida, so coming here from Orlando, um, St. Pete was, a, St. Pete and Tampa, the Tampa Bay area in general, was just a really interesting vibe compared to what I had grown up around. And so, um, although it's different than, it has its own thing going on compared to cities like New Orleans or Memphis or, um, you know, uh, cities or Chicago. I mean, it's funny because we've got a little bit of everybody here. You know, everybody brings kind of, they come from all these major jazz areas and they bring a little bit of that with them. But there's definitely, um, there's, uh, there's a, for me, there is a vibe and there is a history here that I wasn't as, that I wasn't as familiar with even growing up in Orlando. And um, Dwayne, talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I've met some of the figures in this area, but like I said, you've you've come up come up around them. Yeah, I not not being from this area myself, I don't have direct a lot of direct uh, connection with the actual music scene, but I have met a lot of the figures that have been here. Uh, like I mentioned before, Al Downing was the person who gave me my first professional gig when I, once I moved to the Tampa Bay area. Uh, Ernie Calhoun, who's a, a, a saxophone player, he's still around. Uh, we, we helped celebrate his birthday uh, on a Zoom call, JJ, you might remember that. Uh, yeah. Ernie Calhoun is a fantastic saxophone player. He was actually one of the founders of the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association, along with Al Downing himself. How old, uh, they, How old is he now, Dwayne? Again? How old was it? Eighty? I believe it was eighty-five. Yes. Eighty-five. That's right. And did you have a jam session when you celebrated his birthday? Did y'all play too? No, unfortunately, we couldn't do that because it was during this COVID time. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting, a Zoom session mm -hmm. where we uh, got a whole bunch of people that knew Ernie together, and we just had a big uh, Zoom party for him. So, uh, yeah, we weren't able to play uh, music. Although a young saxophone player named Kendrick, McCall Kendrick McAllister did play for him. He actually uh, met Ernie and somebody that uh, Ernie kind of took a liking to. Kendrick's one of our former scholarship winners. He's currently, uh, well, when school starts again, I guess he'll be studying at uh, SUNY Purchase in New York. But uh, Kendrick actually played for Ernie. And uh, when Kendrick was playing, it was, it was funny because you could see Ernie kind of light up, you know, because we were all on screen. So that, that was fantastic. But, um, but as far as the scene goes, there were a few people that were influential. Um, when, I, when I got to the Tampa Bay area, one of the first places that I went to that everybody told me about was the Garden Restaurant on Central Avenue in St. Pete. Buster Cooper held court every Friday and Saturday. And uh, Buster was uh, an in influential figure on a lot of the younger musicians in the Tampa Bay area. He was one, he was sort of like a musical godfather. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there were a lot of people that came under his influence. John Lamb also, John Lamb was a bass player. He and Buster both were part of the Duke Ellington Orchestra back in the 1960s, late 1960s. So, met, um, sorry, have you met John Lee? I don't know, I haven't. I should. Yeah. I, you, you definitely should, <laughs> definitely should. 
So, Twain, how do you incorporate history and then musical proficiency into your educational programs? Well, I, the way I look at it, a lot of playing this music uh, or, or really getting into this music, like I said before, you when you listen, uh, the music sort of rewards the listener, but it also rewards people who have a little sense of the background of the music. So I think knowing a little about the music is important. Uh, we, we were talking uh, yesterday. I just did a, yesterday. I just did a program with some kids over in the uh, YMCA summer camp over in Tampa, and it was great because we talked about the. Uh, we we did a, a, pro, a presentation called "Different Faces of Blues." We talked about how jazz musicians use the the blues in the different ways, and how it developed. So we did a New Orleans blues. We did a blues by Duke Ellington. We did a blues by Thelonious Monk, by Miles Davis. So they got to see all of those different flavors. So doing things like that, I think when you have just a little insight, it makes uh, the whole experience a little more accessible. And you feel, I, I, I think you feel a little more comfortable getting into jazz that way. So everything I do, I love adding some historical background in to the music because I think that uh, again it, it heightens the experience to, to my idea. Can we heighten the experience again for our audiences and have one of you play another song? <laughs> sure. Sure. Do you want to got one JJ? Yeah, I'll do this one, and then because uh, I, I know I know I know what you got up your sleeve, so I want you to. I want you to <laughs> I, I know. Well, uh, d d don't 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 uh, go there because you you may know that. <laughs> I've got lots of things. See, I got big sleeves. <laughs> um. Well, this is actually this is a tune. Um. You know, one of the things in jazz too that a lot of jazz musicians do is adapting. Um, Pop, I mean, just popular music to the to the to the medium. Um, so whether it's R and B tunes, uh, show tunes, um, uh, folk tunes, so all of that, blues, all of that, you know, jazz musicians. There's kind of like seem this tradition of also adapting uh, and arranging or rearranging tunes to fit within the jazz kind of idiom. So uh, and one of those. Uh, artists who fits nicely within that uh, kind of context as what Nicholas Payton, Nicholas Payton would call black American music is the, the great late uh, gone too soon Bill Withers. So this song is called Lovely Day. Without wanting love Weighs heavy on my mind Then I look at you And I know it's gonna be alright Just wanna look at you And I know it's gonna be inside of me 
Always seems to know the way Then I look at you And I know it's gonna be alright Just wanna look at you And I know it's gonna be Lovely day, baby, it's gonna be a lovely day. Oh, lovely day, a lovely day, a lovely day, a lovely day, baby, it's gonna be a lovely day. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So, you know, uh, talking sorry about this uh, live performances streaming on Zoom and Facebook. You know, we got a, a comment on Facebook I wanted to share with you guys from Anita. Uh, she mentioned, uh, thank you for live streaming Monday Night Jazz Hour throughout this quarantine. It's a highlight of our week when we meet our friends online to enjoy great music. Uh, so it's, it's been cool to see you guys, uh, you know, sort of adapt to this situation. Um, but I also wanted to mention, uh, just like Anita did, for anybody watching uh, the show right now on Facebook, if you have questions, comments you want to share or with our guests or with us uh, this evening, uh, just type them in there in the comment section, and uh, and we'll get them ourselves uh, here, and, and we can share them too. So if you have any questions for uh, JJ or Dwayne, uh, please feel free to, to share them there. Um, it sort of reminds me of another comment that we saw on here. Uh, Kimberly on Facebook mentioned that my youngest son plays trumpet and was ecstatic when he got into jazz band at school. Uh, so I want to ask uh, you guys, what are some of maybe the misunderstood or less communicated advantages of uh, music education uh, or being a musician uh, or, or just music in general? Um, well, let's see here. Um, with that, I guess one of the things, uh, <laughs> I'll say this, and I know Dwayne will have some good information to say too, is that uh, you know, there's there's no one, pa the, as I've gone through this, because I've gone through uh, traditional, uh, like, you know, went through the kind of the traditional path where st studying with, uh, I've been fortunate to be surrounded by some ta very talented teachers and mentors, and then went through college and studied formally. But it's funny because you get out and you realize that there is really, uh, there's no one way to do this. And... Mm -hmm. um, I think there's you have to find that path that works for you and uh find you know find that music find that piece of the music that thing that drives you and uh jazz, besides obviously you know the you always hear about the a lot of times the the benefits of something like music education but really also especially studying jazz and especially in the time that we're in now doing your homework and really learning about the history there's a valuable lesson to learn um, just in knowing the history gives you a lot of perspective. Um, the people that you get to work with, I think as artists in general, if you work, uh, it, that's not necessarily just unique to music, but the, the nature of the arts, you just come into contact with so many individuals from all walks of life. And to me, I think that's probably one of the greatest things that I've gained, which isn't necessarily something that you get from being in school. But it's the perspective and the opportunity to work with some amazing people. Uh, you know, you don't, music education also, Dwayne and I have had some great conversations about this. Um, there's a, a lot of conversations about what, mu what, what music education means today and in jazz education. And there's so much you, I think about guys, the, the, the individuals that we study who created this, who laid the foundation for this music. And this music wasn't, formed and it wasn't created in a vacuum it wasn't created in a classroom you know it's lived experiences and playing on the bandstand playing with your playing alongside a 75 year old and you know charlie you know the rumor is charlie parker had the cymbal thrown at his head he, you know that was like you, you don't uh you it's 
you know, it's not easy. And but the but those same mentors who are going to ride your butt are also going to be the ones who are going to show you. Are going to open? They hold the keys to the to the kingdom, if you will. They are going to be the ones. I mean, finding some a talented mentor. There's so much to be learned if you find that right instructor. Dwayne, I know you you have some good stuff to allude to as well. Yeah, I I what what JJ uh, said there. I think that's one of the drawbacks, if you will, of uh, the educational process. The today there's not as many opportunities for uh, young musicians to find somebody like that um you know there there used to be a lot of jam sessions we we have our jam session so it's that is one opportunity where young people are able to come in and stand shoulder to shoulder with a seasoned musician and learn uh you know learn by doing so that that's one of the I, I, like I said, drawbacks, I guess you can call it. There's not as many of those opportunities today as there once was. Um, now, as far as music education, I sort of hit on this earlier when I said, uh, you listening to uh, jazz, the more you know about it, the more you, ha the more background information you have about the music, it will reward you as you go forward. And I think learning uh, you know, learning music in schools, there's there's a, a lot of opportunities to do that. Uh, one of the things that I, 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 I taught music for 12 years in the school system. Um, and one of the things I used to make sure I uh, let everybody know, learning music, nothing but good things can come of that. You know, you, you learn all sorts of skills, even if you don't continue on to become that professional musician. But the discipline you learn from practice, being able to work together in a group with other people. I mean, there's so many skills that you can gain from just uh, learning the process of music. Uh, of getting involved in it. So I always influence anybody I can to get involved in learning music, um, wh whether it be in school or whether it be just learning how to play. I, matter of fact, the, the YMCA uh, presentation I was telling you about yesterday, there was a young man that came up to me afterwards and uh, I, I wasn't aware of who he was, but he said uh, to me, i I played the trombone and uh, I heard you playing. So it was, it was so great to hear you play. And um, I, I said to him, well, are, are you playing in school? And he said, no, I just picked up the trombone uh, because it was, a, I, I, I think he went to an instrument petting zoo. One of those things where uh, they set our instruments out, he picked it up and started playing it and he loved to do it. So it, it, it was something that uh, something that spoke to him, I guess, and he uh, he found something in it that he wanted to do. So he continued on playing, and uh, in in that space we were in, I was able to do something that helped to influence him to go even further into what he was doing. So I, I think that that nature of the educational experience is something that's important. It's just being able to pass something on to uh, someone else, whether it's as a listener or as that young man was actually somebody who's trying to learn an instrument. I think the value of that passing on, the process of passing something on is, is hugely important. So I got a question for you. Jazz has been called America's gift to the world. So what do you see it being able to offer now and uh, where we are today? Deep question. <laughs> That's a big one. There, there are a lot of conversations. Philosophize. It's, it's, it's true. You know, um, there are a lot of conversations going on about this and I mean in a number of fields 
right now. Um, and I'll say this from my unique place in this is um, jazz. And I know Dwayne, will, as always, you know, I'll have some great information to offer too. But um, something I've been thinking about this is okay. Well, you know, if you, jazz kind of if you do your if you study the history of it, just like it's like studying American history. You know, this is a, a, a an interest. <laughs> an interesting time it's a strange time we're in and a difficult time but there's a lot to be learned i mean uh i mean jazz has been there since essentially in some form whether it's the early beginnings to where it is now even if jazz hasn't been in the the mainstream as if it's kind of been on the periphery or has drifted to the periphery it's still been there and it's been a part of the story and it's always kind of had this uh there's always been some sort of a commentary in some way so there are lessons to be learned. I mean, I've, you learn when we discuss, talk about things like race and uh, race relations, or you talk about integration, or you th talk about these ideas of th the aspirations we have for unity and equality. And those things, it's like in a certain way, the jazz, I, I think... And actually, you can look it up. He has some great discussions about this online, too. You can look up on YouTube. Where he... Compromise, being able to swing together, those these ideals, being able to express it. It's like individual, individuality, kind of having that sense of, you know, you're developing your own voice, but also contributing something positive to the... Um, to the conversation and then myself knowing where this music came from making a point to realize the four you know, the the founders of this music were predominantly extremely you know talented uh black and black men and women and recognizing that and saying and understanding you know how does that what does that look like today and how to where is where me being you know, uh, a white male, where does, where does my place fit within that? How can I help to move this story forward? How can I help to communicate this to the next generation of students coming up? What do we need to do to, to move this thing forward? So there's a lot, I mean, like it's a big question, but, um, those are some of the things that have been on my mind anyways. What about you, Dwayne? What do you think about that question? Yeah. One of the things I, I like, one of the things JJ said, the story of jazz really is the story of America, really closely parallels uh, the, the history of jazz and the history of America. As America developed, jazz developed. Uh, one of the things uh, Wynn Marcellus says, uh, I, I love the way he describes it. He said, jazz is, uh, uh, it describes the ultimate form of democracy. It's individuals all taking their individual parts and working together to create something larger than each individual. So I think from that perspective, I, I think jazz has a lot to teach us about just life in general. That's so I, I think there's a, I think jazz, even though like JJ said, it may not be in the mainstream, it may be a little bit on the periphery. I think this music will always be there for us to give us something that we need to move on in life. Dwayne, can you give us a little something? <laughs> Speaking of that something. Dwayne. Speaking of that, mm. jazz has to give us. I think I can play a little something. Right. Uh, again, I the the person in the, that's occupying a lot of space in my mind right now, of course, is Louis Armstrong. Um, he was born on July 4th, but he actually passed away on July 6th. And uh, it's interesting, he passed away two days after his 71st birthday. So this time, you know, it's, uh, it, it's sort of bittersweet, I guess. You celebrate the birth of Louis Armstrong, celebrate the death of Louis, Louis Armstrong. So I'm going to do one of his uh, 
It's probably his most famous piece. One, one, I want you to get something in mind. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. I did this in a Clearwater Jazz presentation. Get that rhythm in your head. And uh, as I play this, you'll be able to fear how that fits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is a wonderful world. Absolutely. Dwayne, as you were playing Thank that, you. I have to comment on that. You, uh, I was just thinking, you know, well, it's funny because Louis Armstrong, you know, his birthday being on the 4th of July, but I can remember growing up and that was usually, I think, and this was the, uh, uh, my mom's side of the family wasn't the, technically the music side, but they were the big appreciation for music. And I can remember that was, my grandfather was a big, uh, Louis Armstrong fan. So, in whenever we were kids, I, I feel like that's the sound that's in the back of my mind. On on Fourth of July, as kids in the backyard was Louis Armstrong's trumpet. So you just kind of triggered that moment as you were playing there. So I had to say that. Well, that's very cool. It's very cool to see that. I I had a, a couple questions uh, for you guys. Uh, one of them comes from Facebook. So uh, John from Facebook asked if you could tell us more about membership in the Alda Downing Association. And uh, for audiences, how can audiences connect with you even throughout COVID-19 and social distancing? So I want to ask you about both. Well, I'll, I'll do the first part and then I'll let Dwayne take, take the second half. Um, as far as memberships go, um, you can go to aldowningjazz.com. We've got some information on there. Um, you can also, you know, if it's easier for you, you can also message us at Facebook. Um, just go to our aldowningtimpabayjazz.com, excuse me, Aldowning Tampa Bay Jazz Association Facebook page. You can send us a private message there and we can get you all set up. But as far as memberships, we've got a few different levels based off of uh, usually like student, adult, um, seniors, and, um, and family memberships. And um, we're fortunate we have a really loyal uh, membership base that supports us and there's all sorts of obviously things are we're like everybody right now we're kind of trying to figure out moving forward what what you know uh like other performing arts organizations our season is a little bit in limbo at the moment so we're trying to figure out uh what that might look like for us but membership is something we're actually we're really kind of um pushing right now just because we depend on our members and uh we, they're very special to us. And Dwayne, tell them how they can, uh, some of the stuff we've got that they can stay in the loop. I, uh, uh, I love seeing those pictures that were on the screen just now. 
uh, some uh, events that we had. One one of them was uh, uh, an event that we did uh, talking about John Lamb. The bass player in that picture was that's John Lamb. Uh, he was doing that, uh, playing along with Theo Valentine, who's a wonderful singer in the area. So I, I loved seeing that. And then uh, the, I believe it was the last picture was from our scholarship competition that we do every year. Um, that's part of a big mission of ours. We award scholarships to graduating seniors in Pinellas County. And uh, that picture came from, I believe it was last year's competition. Well, talking about the current time, we've had to adjust and move to a, a digital platform. We've uh, taken our normal Monday night event, our signature event, the Monday Night Jazz Jam, and we've sort of remodeled it and reworked it for something that works for this current time. We call it the Monday Night Jazz Hour, and we do it every Monday from 6 to 7. And uh, we've, we've uh, been having lots of different musicians come in and it's a, it's, um, it's a great event because it allows us as musicians to be able to play together. Of course, during this COVID time, you know, we've, we haven't been able to do that. But that Monday night experience allows musicians to get together and play together. And for most, I, just about everybody is the first experience playing with other musicians since this whole pandemic started. So it's a big, uh, a, a big thing with all of us. And again, it happens every Monday. Uh, we stream it uh, live on Facebook. So you can definitely check that out. Uh, we've got a big anniversary that we're going to be celebrating this coming Monday. Um, the 12th of July, uh, that date was the date we actually started the Monday Night Jazz Jam at the Hangar Restaurant exactly 10 years ago. So we're, we're going to be celebrating that date on the 13th uh, this coming Monday. So it's a big, uh, big celebration. We're going to have our, what I call the A-Team Rhythm Section for the uh, Hangar Stretch Bruin, who's the pianist that's been with us through most of those 10 years. Ron Gregg, also on drum set, again, been most on most of these through most of the 10 years. And uh, Hiram Hazley, a good friend of ours, is going to be playing bass as well. And I'm going to be playing on that also. So it's, it's going to be a big celebration on this coming Monday. So Monday Night Jazz Hour, remember that every Monday from 6 to 7. Yeah, on yeah. The think Facebook page. Yeah. Yes. Shout out to uh, New Group City, Ken, our good buddy Kenny Walker over at New Group City Music Complex. Actually, I wanted to mention that um, our theme song is by La Jazz. So, and that's Hiram mm -hmm. Hazley's band that we oh, use here. Nice that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Hiram as well. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate the time that you shared with us this evening. It has been fantastic. We could go on for so long, chat. Yeah. So I don't. I don't know if it's just me or Lee. Just goes <laughs> for me. But I. I also wanted to 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 mention uh, JJ and Dwayne. Thanks for spending time with us for the live performances on Zoom. I know it's. Uh, a bit unorthodox but it's, it's what we have to work with now and it's, it's awesome to see you guys adapt zoom here the, yeah zoom is the name of the game right now we're all you know zoom and facebook live has been our uh our, our saving so right now yeah well i i encourage everybody to definitely check uh check out what you guys are doing um uh as uh, potential members also as audiences to see uh especially the monday night jazz hour uh, that you guys are, are doing on, on Zoom and to keep up the good work while uh, staying healthy. Uh, yeah, outdowningjazz.com. Yeah. There's all you can you can sign up for a membership right there. We take payment electronically all on there as well too. So go up and you'll find out some of the stuff that we've got going on. So and thank thank you all so much for having us on. It, it's been a great uh, it's been a great evening for me. I can speak for myself. I had a great time here. So thank you all for doing all that you do with Creative Pinellas as well. Yeah, Lee oh, and Danny, thank you uh, to all of you. It's been just 
awesome to get to, to have this conversation with the two of you. So we'll look forward to more down the road. Indeed. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching tonight. We've got another conversation coming up this Tuesday with Michael Francis from the Florida Symphony Orchestra. That's at three o'clock on our Facebook page. And uh, Danny, do you want to say anything else? I'm trying to remember that I forget. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing is uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank everybody that joined us online tonight um, and everybody that will be watching this video after we're done being live. Uh, Join us uh, virtually here for uh, a night with a uh, with these guys here and it's it's been fun. Thanks for watching. For more information on all the programming and resources from Creative Pinellas, visit creativepinellas.org.